war. It has always been a part of life in the British Isles. From Roman times unto present day, no king or emperor has called this realm his own. Five kings now stand ready to do battle over these lands. They will make Britannia theirs, or die in the attempt. Good day to you all, and welcome to Medieval 2 Total War, the Britannia Campaign. Fred of Asgarnia here, your host as always, and I didn't announce this because I wanted it to be a bit of a surprise. Only one of you knew that I was going to do this. This is Medieval 2 Total War. I know some of you subscribe to my channel for a strategy game. It used to be Empire Total War, but as some of you might know, my file became corrupted, the, computer, the hard drive of my computer crashed, so I lost everything. So I had to cancel that LP. But now, I recently I just rebought Medieval Total War Kingdoms and Medieval Total War 2 for on Steam. So, I figured, why not put up a permanent strategy game? So, this is the form of it. I'm going to... I'm going to basically play one of the campaigns of the Medieval 2 expansion pack, Kingdoms. Basically Medieval 2 Total War 2, or Medieval 2 Total War, was a strategy game developed by the Creative Assembly in 2006, I believe. Basically it saw you command one of the, the major factions of the, um, it was a bit simplified, the sim a simplified faction of one of the main powers of the Middle Ages. You know, after the Norman Conquest in England, I think it starts in 1080, so you know you'd have England, France, the Holy Roman Empire, Spain, Portugal, Venice, because that was a great power until 1798 when Napoleon took it over and ended its sovereignty. But, you know, so the Kingdoms then was a spin-off to that. Basically, it, it was an expansion pack that introduced four new campaigns. They're more, it's basically, the mechanics were the same, but the setting was different. It was more specific. You had a campaign set in the New World, in America. That's, you know, when the Spanish came to colonize America. The Spanish, the English, and the French came along. Then you had uh, the Britannia campaign, this one, which deals with the wars that took place on the British Isles. It around the 13th and... The tw yeah, I suppose you could say the 13th century. So that's the wars between Scotland, between England, Ireland, Wales. Very interesting setting. It's actually one of my favorites. Possibly because I'm a native of the British Isles and I've been living in Ireland for the last couple of years, so, you know. Then, of course, you've got the Teutonic Campaign, which deals with when the Teutonic Order, an order of knights, was formed, I think, in the 1200s, to deal with the last pagan nation in Europe, which was the, the Lithuanians. Of course, the pagan order became, the Teutonic Order became extremely powerful and began to actually be a threat to society, so they had to be put down. I never, I haven't looked into the history of it, so if any of you want to look it up and let me know more, please do. I might look it up myself tonight. And then you have the Crusades campaign. That deals with the Crusades that were undertaken by Pope Urban II and all of his, all of his successes. It was basically an armed crusade to the Holy Land where the knights of Europe, the people of Europe were sent to sent to Jerusalem to take it from the, from the Muslims. And that, is that pretty much sparked a conflict that is still going on to this day. The holy and religious war. That's what it deals with. But anyway, I'm, I'm rambling. 
that's just a summary of the campaign. Now this one, this one as I said is the Britannia campaign. And you can play as four factions. England. Now England as you can see is the dominant power at the beginning. It's like if you've ever played Rome Total War, the Barbarian Invasion. It's like the Western Roman Empire. It controls most of the map, but the trouble is... There's so much trouble with it. Some of these provinces here, like Cardiff I think is here, is on the verge of rebellion. So that's, they'll lose, I think they'll probably lose these provinces immediately. In Ireland I remember the, um, the situation is critical. Dublin revolts fairly quickly, which is a bit of an historical inaccuracy, but considering Dublin was always traditionally loyal to the crown, the Pale it was called, an area loyal to the crown, that's when the Normans, I'll explain that later. Then you've got the Scot, well no, they don't really have any problems here, except in the north, well, you've got a rather large problem in that if you've ever heard of the Barons' Alliance, it was when Magna Carta was signed, the Barons grew tired with King John's tyrannical reigns, they wanted more rights for themselves, so they signed Magna Carta. You have a revolt at these people, I think that has though more to do with Simon de Montfort, but anyway, then you've got the Welsh, English, yeah, they have a basically, England has a wide array of troops, pretty solid infantry, very solid. Solid infantry, uh, very varied, it's a poor variety of cavalry as they say, but the trouble with the cavalry is, everybody is screwed in that sense, so it's not really a disadvantage here. They probably are the most balanced militarily. Then you've got the Welsh. The Welsh, they look like they're in a weak position, but they actually do pretty well for themselves. Their longbows give them a good, give them an advantage. As you can see here, they're actually quite diverse. They have a number of units very capable of fighting in multiple roles. The longbows are, well, the most notable. Safe there. I can't, I don't speak Welsh. Sorry, I'm fasting today, you see. So I'm going to be drinking tea galore. Then you've got the Scots, who I'm really tempted to play as. Excellent use of spears and pikes, but they lack in cavalry. And the nobles, as such, prefer to fight on foot. That means you're going to have men with motherfuckers of axes and swords running around. The great two-handed axes, instead of mounted cavalry. I've played, I've actually... i played, I've only ever played, I think, as Scotland and England. And I've only actually ever won the campaign as Scotland. Then you've got the Irish. The Irish now, they're, the Irish are pretty powerful. They're, they, I've done a bit of research on them. Apparently... They've got a good. They, their heavy infantry is fairly decent, although they haven't got the. They haven't got. They wouldn't have the most in the world. They've got a good mix of cavalry, although in the early period that's not the. They don't have many, to be honest. The cavalry is pretty weak at the beginning of the game, but the diversity in cavalry is weak at the beginning. But it's pretty strong, all the same, and gunpowder units as they come in later. However, they lack strong spear and pike units, and their elite are Jesse javelin men, which use a real. A real Irish tactic of basically guerrilla warfare. Well, it's not true guerrilla warfare, but they throw their spears and then they run away. And then they, you know, they hide behind the main line. That's the um, that's how Ireland won her independence, and I guess it worked then too. Then you've got the Norwegians, who I don't know a whole lot about. Excellent shock infantry who wield powerful two-handed weapons. I'd be inclined to believe that, but lack heavy cavalry. Again, a lot of truth in that actually. I haven't fought the Norwegians extensively. But, anyway, so, I've kind of given you an overview of the factions. Now, I'll tell you which one I'm going to play as. I was torn between, I like England, but I've already played it before. And I'm doing an English campaign as well in my own spare time, so, yeah, I don't really want to do that. Wales, I have not much experience with. Norway, I just don't have much of an interest in... in Nor in Norwegian history, so to speak. I find it interesting, but I don't know a great deal about it. And I like to, you know, have a bit of a background. I like to have a little bit of knowledge of the country I'm playing as. So, Scotland and Ireland I was torn between. But as I've already played as Scotland, Ireland wins out. Plus, let's face it, I've lived in Ireland for the last 15 years. I think that's as good a reason as any. Thus, I've never played as the Irish before, and I'd like to try something different. Okay, so I think that's all I have to say. I'll explain the the mechanics as we as we play the game. So now I will 
shut the flip up and show you an excellent, an excellent sort of, an excellent cutscene, an excellent intro. So no battle time limit. Let's go. Britannia, a land of emerald isles, a land of kings, a land of war. England. King Henry sits upon a hungry throne, thirsty for more land. The Norwegians, warriors happy to pay the blood price for their ambitions. Scotland, from the highlands and across the lowlands comes a spirited people ready for battle. Wales, a people of song and sword, and leaders that will bend their knees to no man. And Ireland, suspicious of his neighbors, the Irish warrior never sleeps, though he dreams of conquest. Britannia, one realm, five kings, total war. Oh, you gotta love the cutscenes for these things, they're truly amazing. They flayed him and divided the pieces of his skin between them, not as keepsakes, but out of hatred of him. Weesburg on the demise of Hugh Cressingham, treasurer of Scotland with the hand of the Scots. Needless to say, he was a traitor. So, here we are. Ireland. Now, as you can see, the map is amplified. This is the, this is a, um, in essence, this is what the, um, the Kingdom's campaign did. Just to point it out, so I don't do it later. One thing I love about this, this, the Kingdom's campaign, gotta be the soundtrack. It captures the essence of, of the area it deals with. Like, I mean, this, the soundtrack here captures the essence of the British Isles. You've got bagpipes from Scotland, you've got illan pipes and fiddles from Ireland. Here you go, again. Sounds familiar, I don't know what the instrument is though, I should really by rights, but... Yeah, basically the Kingdom's map amplified every amplified a small region. So in this case, the map of the British Isles is far more detailed. Now, for those of you who are new to the game, I shall do my best to enlighten thee. First off, you've got Corkig. Cork. Which I don't really... wasn't such a big town at the time. In fact, here I think is Yol. That's Yol just there. Could be wrong, could be somewhere here. But Yol was a small... was actually a huge port town. So much so that Cork at one time was referred to a town near Yol as opposed to the other way around. But we've got Cork, our capital. Left click. Oh, I forgot to turn you off. So, here you've got, basically, I'll go through everything quickly. Firstly, you've got the cities you have. Cork. This is our city. Here you've got how much money you make off the town per turn. 1,340, which is decent. Then you've got public order, which determines whether the town's going to revolt or not. And if it revolts, you're going to have a lot of trouble. You'll see here, because I'm pretty sure the English lose Dublin before long. And then this is population growth. How many people come into the city per term? You have, which, of course, means the city grows. Meaning, more people pay you money. And we all love money, because money is the sinew of war. Then you've got how much money you have, which determines what you can recruit and build. You left click on a building. Before I go any further, I am turning that bitch off. Oh, subtitles. But I do love my subtitles. Okay, metal. None. I hate the advisor. I know how to play these games. Sort of. I can't guarantee you whether I'll win this, but it'll be fun to see whether I can. Then you've got the building screen. This determines what you can build, and for the record, when you're starting off a game, what you really want to do is build up your economy first. So to build up your economy, you want to build sort of... Sorry, these songs are distracting me because I have them on, on my PSP. But um, you want to build things that will give you money. So communal farming increases farms and food, food, food production. That means you get more people, and when you get more people, you get more in taxes because there are more people to pay them. So I'm going to up my tax rate as high as it'll go. Just so I can rake, rake in as much money as possible. 
mines, very good. That brings me, that, as you can see, brings in money per turn, which is always a good thing. Town Hall, Diplomat. Well, I'm going to want a Diplomat, not to deal with the English, but just, I want to send, I want to send emissaries to, um, Scotland. Scotland, Wales, you know, just so that I can make a little bit of money in trade. Tipperary, oh wait, forgot to show you the recruitment screen. Here you can see, Cathairna. Cathairn. I, I did Irish for, I've lived in Ireland for years, so I've, I've studied Irish for eight years, but I, more than that, no, maybe 11 or 12 years, I don't do it anymore now, because I have my exemption. So as you can see, these are infantry you can train. The number here den denotes how many you can train at any given time. So there are two, as you can see. These are light infantry. Not bad. Decent enough. And, oh, here, it means warband, apparently. Then you've got the DSC Javelinman. Native tribesmen lived in Ireland for centuries. Hardy trains in the ways of war. You know, they throw javelins and they run, run around like hell, as any sensible human being would. Then you've got the faction overview, which is it's quite small. It's a lot of this is very trimmed down. It's very concise since you're only dealing with a small area. So, faction. This is this you know this just tells you little bits and pieces about your faction. So here you've got Cork, our faction leader, King Brian, our greatest leader, King Brian. Generals, we have five. Regions, four. Cities. It just gives you a breakdown of everything you have. This is the AI spend policy. Now, I prefer to manage everything myself, so I don't use this too often. But when your empire gets bigger, it helps so that you can just have a... You have something, somebody to do all the work for you. Then you've got the diplomacy screen, which tells you who you're allied with, who your vassals are, who your enemies are. I think we're only really at war with England at the moment, and the rebels. But that's in eight. You're always going to be at war with rebels. Now, then Tipperary. It's a long way there. We'll build... Land clearance. We will up the tax rates because they are happy people, and we will recruit. Oh, Gaelic archers. Yeah, they're just archers. Nothing more to say there, really. Get us a unit of Cathalna. Dublin. There, that'll revolt quickly, quickly enough. Tipperary, Cork, and then you've got Lifford up here to the north. Wooden castle. See, castles you can build... English billmen. Oh, that's another thing. That's another thing actually unique to this... <coughs> to this game. The units you can train isn't limited to your faction, but it's limited to your culture. See, culture is how much... how loyal you are to a certain country. So in this case, the culture is 60%... is 80% Irish, which means we can recruit a lot of Irish units. But at the same time, due to its proximity to England, or because of its English influences, there's a 20%, there's an English population here. Which means that we can recruit English billmen. So we can have English units in our army, or Welsh units, or Irish units. We can have, un depending on what the culture is for, an er for, an, for a region, we can have certain men. So then you've got population growth. Uh, as you can see, this is how many people. This, the people. Then, public order. What's keeping public order? What's keeping the people in line? Income, the breakdown, this is how much we have, this is what we're losing. So, we're going to train a unit of English billmen and some horse boys, along with some archers. Why not? See, castles allow you to build bigger and better units. These are the military, these are your military centers. We're going to upgrade that to an actual castle. Then we're going to build roads, because roads, they strengthen trade. And, you know, trade... It means your armies can move faster, it bolsters your income. Ostmen. Not sure what Ostmen are. Again, I haven't played this game extensively, so I know not. Now, these things are permanent forts. In the vanilla Total War games, and the original ones, a fort was a temporary structure you'd erect to defend a strategic point. But now, here you have permanent forts. As you can see, we've got a sizable army there. Reardra, which are free by garrison. I'm pretty sure they're knights. This is one thing Ireland isn't famous for, her knights. Okay, now, time to discuss strategy. And she's not really, Ireland isn't famous for her cavalry. So really you want to, you want to rely mostly on your infantry. Heavy infantry. Who do you want dead, my lord? Ah, the Jesus, or Irish. I couldn't tell you now where the accent's from, but I like it all the same. 
Right. So, then you've got... Okay, just to... Briefly, I know this is going to be very dull to those of you who know the game, but I have one philosophy with Total War games or any sort of strategy game. For the love of Jesus, explain everything. If you weren't, new, if you didn't know what the game was about, I'd like if I if I were new to the game and I didn't know what it was about, I would love somebody to explain it all. So that's what I'm doing. Alwi, he's an assassin. He does what he says on the tin. He goes into buildings and slits throats and blows shit up. Always a positive. Spies. Something to investigate. You sound Scottish, not Irish, but I'm not complaining. Yes, my king. You sound like Billy Conley, actually. Okay, so your job... Oh, and Dan Patrick, I forgot about you. Spies, they spy. They find out stuff. Again, self-explanatory. We're gonna up the tax rate as much as possible. The culture also actually has a positive effect on public order. So if... Say you have a 70% Irish population, and you're playing as Ireland. Well, naturally, the people are going to be more endearing to you. They're going to like you more, because you're an Irish... You're... You're an Irish faction. Now, a strategy. What we're gonna do is... We're gonna focus on trying to drive the English out of Ireland. This is rather a popular theme in Irish history. Anybody who happens to have studied us might realize that... Cracking English skulls is something deeply bred into the Irish psyche, something that we're trying to fix. It's something that we're really trying to get, build a bridge and get over these last, maybe, 50 years. Whether it's working or not, that's subject to opinion. I'd like to think things were evening out. But what we're going to do first is we're going to move this... No, we're going to keep him garrisoned here. I'll be recruit men in... Lifford. In the north of Ireland. Now, of course, the north of Ireland, traditionally, or nowadays, has a very... Well, it's Donegal, I suppose. But it has a very loyalist population. There'd be very strong ties to England. Now, granted, or to Britain. And only, of course, that doesn't apply to everyone. There'd be great controversy if I said that. But, you know, for the most, there is a strong loyalist base there. South is different. Cork? Bloody rebels. A lot of them. But because we're playing as the Irish, we like the rebels. So we're going to get some Jesse Javelinmen and some Katharina, whatever, however they're pronounced. So, let's end the turn, see how things go. Candidate for adoption, Aidan Nolan. See, I should be able to pronounce all of these names. Mm, he's not bad. And as you can see, occasionally you'll have people who can be adopted to your family. This bloke, this is basically a breakdown. Command, how good he is in battle. Dread, see in this game there's something called Dread and Chivalry. Dread is how feared he is, chivalry is how noble he is. Ideally, you want your men to be chivalrous, but given the situation, having a heartless bastard doesn't hurt either. Loyalty, whether they like to desert you, and management, how good he's likely to manage a city. But we're gonna adopt him, because we need people. Me Jesus, we found a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, lads! We're the richest. And we also have people. We also have soldiers. Now that we have our diplomat as well, I'm going to I want to send him to Scotland. So we'll get Cog. Cog is a ship, not a shoe. Just to clear it up. Aye. Who needs a second smile? Is it a person or a place then, sire? It's neither. I don't want you to do anything just yet. Dublin will revolt There's eventually. Something to investigate. Something to investigate. They shall not see me, sire. So there's nobody in here. If I sent troops in, I could garrison this force and hold it against virtually anything. Trim. Very weak. Yes, sire. Ugh, something tells me my spy is gonna get killed trying to get in. He's gonna get killed on the way in. How he's gonna walk past like that? How the hell did you manage that? What, do bushes just routinely up and grow in Ireland? I know it's the land of leprechauns, but really? Okay, yeah, we get the point. So now we can see what they have. And it looks like... Be gone. You are not my leash. Who do you want dead, my lord? Who see if you can slit what throat. needs removing, sire? This will demoralize their army, so it can actually be beneficial to slit the throats of their... Army commanders. Oh, it worked! But they don't actually, they don't actually have the, um... They don't actually... That's a shame. They don't actually show the, um, the assassination clips anymore. Cruel leader, because I use assassins. Sue me. 
I will only address you, you in battle. battle. Alright, after that, yes, I want you to you. see what Capitan William Nugent has. Oh, sorry, it's Captain Morgan now, isn't it? Be God, Drunkard. You are not my lead. As I've said, the English Come have a... get me. The English are bloody Coward. strong. They have good infantry, and their cavalry is the envy of the world in this game. So, you want to tread carefully when you're fighting the English. The advantage you have... Okay, occasionally you'll get messages from the council, from a council, from your council of nobles. That's your court, basically. They'll give you certain tasks they want accomplished, and in this case, it's an assassination mission. We have ten turns to do it, and we have to slit someone's throat. This miscreant's demise would, would please a great many people, not to mention make smoother our path to success. The council suggests you send an assassin to hasten this man's journey into the next world. Maurice Fitzgerald. Yeah, Fitzgerald, Fitzgerald was a Norman family, actually. Anything Fitz is actually Norman. A lot of them married into Irish families, so... Something to investigate. So who's Maurice Fitzgerald? He, sound, he sounds, like an, it sounds like an Irish name. Yes, my king. Seems the English are... Moving quietly. Seems like the English are either planning to march on Derry to support us. As you can see, they've got Irish kerns. Because Derry has an Irish popular, you know, is an Irish is largely Irish. They can recruit Irish units. Now, if we're going to attack, we just we have a very weak setup here. We want good heavy infantry. If we're gonna, we want good infantry if we're going to break through. And for that not to happen. Okay. Anyway, 